Hey folk welcome to our channel. So in this video we are gonna see, what if Naruto was Emperor of West, this is part 1, and if you want to see more of this, then please leave a like share and subscribe, and show love to author of this fanfic, let's get in the video. The continent of the elemental nations is much bigger than people realize, as it was once part of a much larger land mass than the maps that are shown today. If one was to look at the map, they would see that the map doesn't show what is in the west, beyond Iwa and Suna, beyond the country of earth and wind. For you see, all of the elemental countries are located at the eastern side of the country as a whole, and what lies beyond those two countries is a giant wall, stretching for miles, from the most northern part of the continent to the southern part, completely sealing the east from the west. It is this wall that holds back the violence from the west spilling over to the east. When comparing powers, the west were superior from the east in every way, whether it would be technology, fighting styles, or even powers. The comparison between was so huge that it was like having a huge demonic dragon reigning over his land versus a small frog in his small well. Nobody, from the Kages of shinobi villages to the daimyos ruling over their domain, would risk crossing this wall. Even the legendary Ichihamadara himself dared not to cross over the wall, in fear he would draw attention to even one war hardened factions there. Beyond this massive wall, a wall that was forged during the time of the Sage of the Six Paths by the Sage himself, were warlords, samurais, shinobis, assassins, and even demons that all fought to protect their own individual territories from their rivals. It had been the reason why the Sage made this wall in the first place, as he knew the East would easily be consumed by the powers of the West without the wall. Years later, the Uzumaki clan from Whirlpool were commissioned by many feudal lords of the East to use their mastery of the sealing arts to cover the walls with seals to prevent deterioration and strengthen it. Before he died, the Sage of the Six Paths proclaimed that if the conflicts of the West was brought over to the East, more than one half of the East would be wiped out before a proper counter-response could be mounted. Of course, legends and myths fade through the passage of time. The warnings were ignored as the East believed themselves to be powerful, perhaps invincible. Nobody dares to cross over, though. Why would they? There was no point in going over to a war-torn land to conquer if they believed nothing of value could be obtained. Through time, warnings were ignored as the arrogance and stupidity of the East grew. Until a single incident would become the catalyst that would completely shake the very foundations of the East. And that specific incident came on a day when Ichiha Sasu decided to defect from Kanoha to join Orochimaru, but failed to accomplish that goal, thanks to the effort of one Yuzumaki Naruto, and was brought back to Kanoha. The two had fought each other in brutal battle, as Naruto was on a mission to bring Sasuke back to the leaf, while the Ichiha's own was to slay his pursuer for greater power. Naruto had suffered two Chidori to his chest, but endured the lethality of the Jutsu and the pure torment that came along with the rest of his injuries from the battle to return Sasuke back to Konoha. On the last clash of Chidori versus Rasengan, Naruto used two tails worth of chakra to overwhelm Sasuke. The blonde shinobi hoped his actions would prove that he was not a monster, was not the QB, and most importantly, finally prove himself worthy of Kanoha's recognition. The council, composed of 11 civilians, 11 clan heads, two advisors, and the Hokage, would finally acknowledge him. He was sadly mistaken. Flashback begins. Genin Ninja number 012607 Yuzumaki Naruto. Tsunade said in a dull voice, not trusting her voice, it is my duty to inform you that a vote has taken place, and a majority decision of 17-8 has been made in the council to strip you of your rank and banish you from Kanoha, effective immediately. The reason being is that you have inflicted grievous damage to the last Ichiha despite your mission. You have until next sunset to leave the Leaf Village, and should you ever return. You will be killed on sight. Another reason that Tsunade didn't say out loud was that everyone had felt Naruto use the QB's chakra and was afraid of the fox getting loose, even though the fourth sealing ability would never allow it. Naruto had been summoned to the council while still sporting many injuries from his battle. The council didn't even allow Naruto to recover from his wounds before being banished. Naruto looked crestfallen at this statement as he looked around at the council. The civilians and advisors all had smug looks on their faces, enjoying the fact that the demon brat would finally leave, the curse would be gone. Danzo had two votes, as he controlled the Shimura and was the current voice for the Ichiha until Sasuke was of age and used them to banish Naruto. He had his own plans, of course, of forcibly recruiting the Jinch Kriki into root while he was no longer in the village's sight. The last clans to vote for the banishment was the Kuruma and Inuzaka clan, who had thought Naruto was the QB, one through popular opinion and the other by instinct and smell. The rest of the clan heads looked at the voters in disdain. Tsunade looked like she was about to cry as she saw Naruto's heartbroken face and resisted showing any emotion in front of the heartless bastards who ripped Naruto's dreams away from him. Naruto slowly took off his headband before laying it on the floor. He reached to take off his necklace, only to be halted by Tsunade. Keep it. 
It's yours, and I hope it'll protect you, Tsunade said, tears already leaking out. Naruto left the council room, heading back home to pack up. Flashback ends. Before the council was dismissed, the 17 voters quickly also revoked the Sandame's law about Naruto being the container of the QB, allowing the young generation to learn the truth. The news spread fast amongst them, and reactions varied from one extreme to another. As Naruto walked back to his home to pack, he saw the rest of the Konoha 12, excluding himself and Sasuke. Abaka deserves to die for hitting Sasuke-kun. Ranted Sakura. Agreed. We should go find that demon and kill him. Ino shouted, agreeing with Sakura. He was the fox all along, I should have known. I could smell that scent off him, he should have died, growled Kiba. How unyouthful. Naruto has lied to us and was the fox. Exclaimed Lee. Naruto was already crying and almost lost hope, contemplating suicide when a voice he thought he would never hear say this rang out. Shut up Lee, said Nichi coldly. Lee looked shocked at this statement and was about to argue when he saw Tenten also staring coldly at him too. He is like me, no worse off than me. He has a seal like mine, except worse. Even with this caged bird seal, I am acknowledged among the people as a shinobi and a prodigy, Naruto has a seal that holds the QB at bay, and yet many people in this village despises him. And yet, into sinking into despair, he kept defying his fate as a scapegoat. He even forced me to see that fate was, indeed, a bitch, and that I should not go along with it. Even I am familiar with seals, as I use it for my weapons. A scroll holding a kunai is not the kunai itself. Naruto is still Naruto, while the QB is inside, sealed away, added Tenten. These idiots can't even tell the difference between a scroll and a kunai. Hanada was crying, although Naruto was unsure why. Troublesome, muttered Shikamaru. He also believed Naruto was not the QB, but was currently unable to form words as he was too mad. Chaoji stood behind Shikamaru, eating his way through his fourth bag of chips. Thank you, said Naruto silently, as he left for his house. Shino was forgotten in all this. The news spread fast among everyone that Naruto had been banished, and the majority of the citizens were celebrating. Shinobis and Kinoichis were getting rowdy and celebrating the fact that the demon that had plagued them for so long was gone. Only a few citizens and shinobi were depressed that a shinobi was being banished for doing his job. As night fell upon the town, people were still celebrating. Naruto, however, was gathering his meager items into his pack and getting ready to leave. Kakashi and even Jiraiya, his two teachers he thought he could depend on, never showed up to even say anything. As he was about to cry himself to sleep, somebody knocked on his door. He didn't want to get it, guessing that it was one of the people who hated him, but the knocking became insistent. He got up and opened the door and yelled, what do you want? Can't you leave me in peace? He looked up and saw it was Hiyashi, clan head of the Hyuga clan. Behind him was Hinata, who was blushing and poking her fingers together, as she didn't know why she was here either. May I come in, Naruto? I promise I won't hurt you, stated Hiyashi. Stunned at this, he let them both in before closing the door. After Hiyashi came in, he quickly closed all the windows and blinds, before placing a silencing seal on the walls. This conversation never happened Naruto, stated Hiyashi seriously. Naruto gulped, not knowing why he was here. I have come to ask you for a favor, Hiyashi said, surprising both Naruto and Hinata. I need you to take Hinata with you on your exile. Hinata started to cry and tried her best to stop the tears. My father doesn't even want me anymore. She thought sadly to herself. Naruto was mad. How could a father abandon her daughter like this? The next statement, however, surprised both of them. I do not have much time anymore from preventing my daughter from being branded with the caged bird seal. I do not wish for her to be locked up in a cage and sent to a loveless marriage, all to increase the Hyuga's wealth. I have tried my best, but the elders have decided against my decision to brand her and sell her off to someone. I would rather have her fly freely with someone whom she loves and become a missing nin than to see that happen. Said Hiyashi. He lowered his head to the ground, bowing to Naruto. Please. Protect my daughter. Naruto was astounded that someone of Hiyashi's status would be willing to bow to him, while Hinata was surprised and felt loved. All those years of insults within the Hyuga clan and her father actually loved her, even if his actions did not seem like it. I promise I will dad Abeo. But why me? I thought you hated me. Naruto said. Hiyashi laughed at this, scaring both pre-teens. I could never hate you. You are the son of my best friend. You know my family? Tell me please. Interjected Naruto, desperate to learn about his family. All his life, people told him how he was unwanted, that he was abandoned. The third Hokage always said differently, but never revealed his heritage to him. Unfortunately, I'm not allowed to on the risk of treason. Spat Hiyashi. Naruto seemed to despair at this. I believe this is over. On a side note, I'm going to suddenly become absent-minded and drop something and never remember it at all. 
It might contain information about your family, though it would be best if you read it after you have left the village. Hiashi said as he stood up and accidentally dropped a scroll in front of Naruto. Hinata, come. We have much to prepare. As they left, Naruto was left stunned on his bed when he suddenly went into a trance and appeared in his mindscape. He looked around and saw the QB staring back at him. What do you want? Asked Naruto coldly. The QB could only sigh, I guess it is my fault you're being banished, kid. Though I never understood why you wanted to be Hokage of this forsaken place. Naruto remained silent at this. It was true he wanted to be Hokage, but would never see it. Even if he hadn't been banished, he realized that the people would never allow him to become Hokage due to their hatred for being the Jinchuriki of the QB. My point being is, as an apology, I'll help you train using my power. Said the QB Naruto instantly didn't trust him, but said he would consider it. That night, Naruto wasn't alone as he thought he would be. Tuchi and AM closed down their shop for the day and brought Raymond to try to cheer Naruto up. Haruka came along with them, as they were all frustrated that Naruto had been banished for doing his job. In the end, all good things came to the end as sunrise came too soon. Naruto had packed all his belongings before preparing to leave. He left quietly out of Konoha, as he did not want to stay there any longer. Hinata had already been snuck out earlier by her father and was waiting at a tree where they had agreed to meet. After meeting with Hinata, both took one last look at Konoha before traveling west. The plan was to travel to Suna, where they might be able to find sanctuary. Before they even went one mile out, they were intercepted by two people they never expected to see. Niji and Tenten were waiting by some trees, with gears packed and seals ready to go. What are you guys doing here? Asked Naruto. And Niji Nisan. Tenten. Stuttered Hinata, terrified they were there to bring her back. Relax, we're going with you, stated Tenten. Hinata-sama, I have sworn to protect you. I cannot protect you if you leave, so I will accompany you, proclaimed Niji. At this, both Naruto and Hinata started to have tears in their eyes. They tried to convince them to go back, that they would be fine, but were unable to do so. Instead, they decided to stop after moving ahead a little more to allow Niji and Tenten more time to think about their decision before going too far out. The night quickly fell upon the four travelers, so they decided to rest at an opening they found. Naruto tried to convince Tenten and Niji one more time to head back, but both were stubborn. Niji swore to protect Hinata, and Tenten wanted to go with Niji while leaving Kanoha's corruption. Since she was also an orphan, she wasn't really leaving anyone behind. Suddenly, some bushes shook from behind them. Grabbing their kunai and going into Tajutsu stances, they met. Hanabi and Kanohimaru. Boss. Wani san. Cried out Hanabi and Kanohimaru, both of them going to Naruto and Hinata and hugging them. What are you two doing here? You need to go back, it's not safe. Yelled Naruto. I'm not leaving you boss cried out Kinohimaru. I didn't want to be alone, Hinata Nisan. Said Hanabi as she cried her eyes out. After letting tears flow out of all of them, Naruto finally asked the question that had popped out of their minds. How did you find us? Some ninjas lead us to you, they said they were going to help you, said Kinohimaru. At this, they all froze. Inside Naruto's mindscape, the QB suddenly yelled out Kit. Dodge. Move. Yelled Naruto. As they all moved, the ground they were standing on was suddenly filled with shurikens and kunai. Seeing how close to death they had just been, Hanabi and Kinohimaru couldn't stop shaking. Ten shinobis with Anbu mask and the root sign on their masks appeared. Naruto Uzumaki, you will accompany us back to Danzo-sama where you will be trained for his greatness, stated their leader in a monotone voice. The shinobi looked around and saw the others. Three Hayugas, one Siratobi, and an orphan. You will all come with us for training with Danzo-sama too. You do not have any choice. I'm not going back to that hell hole yelled out Naruto as he took a fighting position. Everyone took up fighting positions until there was another interruption, making the situation seem worse. Well, well, if it isn't the QB brat. Said Kissam. Naruto, come with us, said Itachi with an emotionless voice. Crap, this couldn't get any worse thought Naruto. HMPH. Let me take over for a while, and I'll show them what it means to mess with me, the Lord of Foxes. Shouted the QB Naruto shook his head. He couldn't trust the demon to protect his friends yet. Suddenly, one of the root Anbu made a hand seal, causing Niji to suddenly collapse in pain. The man removed his mask to show that he was a main branch Hayuga that had come under the disguise as a root Anbu. Hahaha. <laughs> Not only can we get rid of the weakling heirs of Yashi, but we can also put the branch family in their place. Laughed the shinobi. Niji. The young shinobis cried out. Gu, leave me. S save, yourselves. Roared out Niji as he clutched his forehead. I won't leave you. Cried Tenten. What do I do? Though Naruto. Everything was going bad, and a deal with the devil or a miracle could save them now. Said miracle suddenly came crashing through some trees. Incoming. 
shouted a figure before crash landing right into the middle of all of them. The Akatsuki members watched in amusement, young Shinobis in confusion, and Root without any emotion. Soon the dust cloud cleared out, and a young man with slick black hair combed back with a few stray hair in front of his forehead, came out from the crater he had created. He had a yellow tank top, blue washu pants, and green wristbands. His brown eyes, though, told them that this was a warrior. Woot. New jump record. Yelled the figure, clearly ignoring the situation he was in. He looked around before spotting Niji, who was still on the ground clutching his forehead. He was clearly seizing what was wrong with him. Naruto and Hinata took positions in front of him while the rest were still trying to get Niji up. Before anyone could move, he suddenly disappeared and reappeared in front of Niji. Before anyone could do anything, the man around removed Niji's headband and was curiously peering at the caged bird's seal. Cool. Souvenir, said the man as he put a piece of paper on Niji's forehead. Before anyone could figure out what was happening, a loud ripping sound could be heard, followed by a scream of sudden pain. Did he just put a piece of sticky tape paper on the brat's forehead? Asked Kissum curiously. Bastard. Growled Naruto as he tried to tackle the man with Hinata, who completely dodged it without much effort. Wait. Look at his forehead exclaimed Tenten in shock. Everyone looked and saw that instead of the cage bird seal, there was now just a red mark on Niji's forehead. What? Impossible. Growled the Hayuga. He ran up to the man to try to deliver a Jayuken strike to the man's heart. Before he could, though, a foot ended up right on his face. Nice job running into my foot, joked the man as his leg was stretched out in front of him. Frustrated, the Hayuga swiped the foot away and tried to hit him, but the man was too agile. You're within range of my divination. 8 trigrams 32 palms. Yelled the Hayuga. Before the first palm even went off, the man grabbed the Hayuga by his wrists, effectively stopping the attack. Hope you're ready for a beatdown cause here it comes. Shout the man as he broke both the Hayuga's wrist. The shinobi couldn't even react as the other man tossed him down before laying a barrage of fists that even Itachi had trouble seeing with his Sharingan. Well that was boring, said the man before looking around. At this, all the root Anbu jumped into action. Hand seals were blazing through all of them, hoping to use a long-range jutsu to finish this dangerous man off. Fire style, fireball jutsu. Yelled out many of them. Soon, nine fireballs were flying towards the man who was just standing there. W watch out. Yelled Hinata. She couldn't stand to see someone who had saved them die. Naruto was about to use his shadow clones when the QB spoke up, Kit, watch carefully. Huh? Grunted Naruto. The QB continued, this man isn't ordinary he might be even more powerful than me. Before Naruto could comprehend what the QB just said, the man shifted his position a bit so that his left part of the body was facing towards the root shinobis. His left hand was covering his right fist that was behind his body. As the fireballs came closer, he threw his right fist out in front and yelled out shotgun. Without the use of any hand seals, the man's hand glowed bright blue and started shooting out many tiny blue blasts from the fist. It went right through the fireballs, extinguishing them and hitting all the root ninjas within seconds, they were all dead. Well, that was easy, said the man while rotating his arms around. He looked at the others, who were still in awe of him. Seeing this, he started bragging. I'm awesome right? Said the man while his nose seemed to be growing longer. Everyone sweat dropped at this. Itachi was the first one to shake it off before turning his attention back to Naruto, although he still kept a wary eye on the man. Hum with us Naru Itachi stopped and noticed something wrong with this picture. Naruto no longer had a headband, which was weird since he wanted to become a Hokage from past facts. There were two clearly unmarked Hayugas and one X-marked Hayuga, and two other random people. None of them seemed to be on a mission, but rather were trying to run away. Before he could contemplate this further, the man suddenly stood between him and the children. Listen, buddy, I don't know why you want these brats, but if you want them, then you have to go through me first, stated the man as he pounded his fists together. Kissum looked gleeful and was about to attack when Itachi suddenly raised his hand first, cutting off Kissum from attacking. Kissum glowered at Itachi, but lowered his sword. Naruto, explain. Are you no longer a shinobi? Itachi asked. At this, Naruto lowered his head in shame and tears, confirming that it was true. At this, Itachi took a step forward and turned to Kissum. This is where we part ways, he stated. Kissum looked at him confused. I made a promise to protect Konoha and uphold the fourth's wishes. Clearly, Kanoha has fallen from its grace, but I will not fail the other one. Leave if you do not wish to fight, for I do not wish to have to kill you. Kisum looked at Itachi as if he was crazy before sighing and sitting down. I may have joined Akatsuki for fun, but even still, you're still more fun to be with. I'll go with you and leave Akatsuki. Itachi stood still for a while before acknowledging Kisum's decision before turning to the man. Thank you for protecting them. No problem, replied the man, what's wrong with blonde, though? 
After everyone got comfortable around the campfire again, Naruto explained his story to all of them. After finishing his life story, the man looked like he was ready to march to Konoha and destroy them. My foolish little brother, muttered Itachi, it looks like he has fallen further than I imagined, along with Konoha. In that case, why don't you come with me? Said the man. Everyone looked at him, thinking about before they decided to ask the big question. Where are you from? Asked Tenten, who had Niji's head on her lap. From the west, over that giant wall, stated the man. Everyone froze. They had been educated that anyone from the other side of the wall was dangerous. Kissum looked even more excited to fight him now. H how did you wind up here? Asked Hinata. I jumped. Was doing a jumping contest against my friend and I took a bit too far stated the man. I can protect you guys. Although I admit, you easterners really are weak. Not much of us bother going over the wall, since it usually repels most of us, but I'm an exception. Though I warn you the west is really chaotic. Lots of fighting almost every day. They all looked at each other before agreeing to go with him. Naruto, Hinata, Tenten, Niji, Hanabi, and Kanahamaru didn't have anywhere else to go now. Itachi was going to protect the fourth's legacy, and Kisum was more excited to see the west, where he had heard that there were people even more powerful than him, everyone packed up after sleeping at night and left in the morning. This is where it begins. This is where Naruto and his friends go to the west, where they never see the elemental nations until much later. This is where Naruto grows up, and along with his friends, becomes emperor of the west. By the way, who are you Dadabeo? Asked Naruto. Bright never introduced myself. I'm the baddest in my land. One of the strongest people in my land. The name is. The Imperial Palace of the West was a sight to see. Its majestic building along with its vibrant culture could be the envy of any nation. The gardens were filled with beautiful and rare flowers, all neatly organized to enhance the view. Inside the building, there was majestic red carpets with golden linings. Any place the carpet was not touching was high-quality wood, and the walls were made of finest materials. Doors were made of the best quality, and each doorknob and intricately designed. On the walls were paintings, made by the most skilled artists. What were the paintings of? The subject was, of course, the emperor himself. Each painting could be seen with him in it, fighting and bleeding in war. Other paintings were peaceful ones, some of it with his family. Most people knew that this family had come from the east with one of theirs. Most of them scoffed when they first saw them, but they proved themselves to be worthy. After years of fighting and negotiating with various warlords, they rose and formed this new empire, the Empire of the West. In the centuries of fighting, there was finally peace in this land. Now, warlords who had fought against each other for blood and land, now pledged loyalty to the emperor. The man himself was sleeping on a king-sized bed, slightly drooling. With his sun-kissed blonde hair, the man's most noticeable part of his face was the whiskers. Beside him was a beautiful woman with long dark blue hair and was currently cuddling with the emperor himself. Soon, the sun was up, the birds were singing, and... Splash! Both of them woke up with a water balloon thrown at their face. Time to wake up. Sputtering, Naruto and Hinata woke up, naked from their activities last night. Standing on the balcony was the man who brought them over to the west, Yusu Kirameshi. Next to him was a six-year-old pink-haired girl named Yuchiro Kusajishi. Hehehe. <laughs> King-san and Bubi-chan are awake. You'll pay for that. Naruto roared as the two pranksters quickly jumped off running. Before he launched himself out the window, Hinata grabbed him back. You don't want to go out without any clothes. I'm the only one who's allowed to see you in all your glory, said Hinata. Blushing, Naruto quickly put on some clothes. Before leaving to chase them, he kissed Hinata soundly before leaving. Hinata stretched her arms up before relaxing, letting her impressive bust jiggle a little. She looked out the window before getting dressed. As Yusuke and Yuchiru were running from Naruto again, who was throwing random items at them to stop again, they passed by four people. There he goes again. Honestly, you'd think he would act his age for once and not corrupt little children, too. Sighed Tenten as she was holding Taniji's hand. They had married around the same time Naruto and Hinata did, making it a double wedding. When they had first arrived at the west, there were so many things for them to learn. Luckily, Yusuke was there to help them, along with his friends. Although Hai with his sarcastic manner would usually piss them off. After a year of living with them, Naruto then had the dream of uniting the lands, making it peaceful. At first, many laughed, but Yusuke thought it was a good idea. Since then, they went to other warlords and fought for lands, negotiated on others, and learned different skills. Tenten went under the tutelage of a ninja clan, who was led by Yuffie Kisaragi. I think Yuchiro was already like that before Yusuke even reached him, replied Niji. He took the gentle fist to new heights after fighting so many different masters, especially those from the building of Ryaz and Paku, where he trained with their grand disciple. The masters still kicked his butt after all these years, but he was closing the gap a little. Although small in members, each of their members was accomplished masters in their art. 
Anabi and Kanohimara nodded in agreement with Niji. These two young shinobis were a couple a year after uniting the West. They kept arguing with each other so much before, but in the end, Kanohimara just gave up, grabbed her, and kissed her. Hanabi blushed so hard that she showed that she was indeed Hanada's sister and fainted. Both of them had learned so much from learning under Naruto and Niji, following them as their guides. Stop moving. Yelled Naruto as he started to throw kunais. Yusuke and Yuchiro were still laughing as they ran out to the sparring grounds. Here, sounds of swords and other weapons clashed clanging against each other could be heard. Yuchiro quickly climbed up to the shoulder of Zaraki Kenpachi. And San, King San not happy about a joke. She giggled. Ichiru, we discussed this, don't climb onto me when I'm fighting, groaned Kenpachi. His opponent was actually Kisum, who just shrugged. Hey, we can fight later. Looks like Emperor's up anyways. On the side sipping his tea was Itachi. He just calmly greeted Naruto before returning back to his tea. It's almost time for the unification festival Naruto-sama, Itachi said as he sipped his tea. Glad you have to deal with the paperwork, laughed Yusuke. When they had unified all of the West, Naruto had expected Yusuke to become emperor and was prepared to serve him. Then Yusuke just dumped it all into his lap, saying he wasn't suited for it and that he needed to spend more time with his wife Keiko. Naruto shuddered. Keiko was a mere civilian and yet she could easily tame them all with her fist. Even Kisum didn't try to actively piss her off on the threat she would make sashimi and shark fin soup. Having a powerful husband that could do that helped. Plus, everyone agreed Naruto had more charisma and leadership talent. Suddenly, a ninja appeared from the shadows. These ninjas had been trained to truly lie in the shadows, unlike the eastern shinobis where flashy jutsus were used. The Brotherhood, once an independent guild of assassins, were joined by others and truly perfected the art of silent death. My lord, two men wished to meet you. They claimed to have intimate knowledge of your life back from the east. Suddenly, the atmosphere went cold. Naruto's life back at the east, along with all the other easterners, were public knowledge except for Kisum. Nobody really cared since they knew he was violent and loved fighting, but was loyal enough. I see. Have them meet me in the royal throne room. I'll be there shortly, Naruto growled. The ninja walked into the shadows and melded in, disappearing from sight. Naruto walked into the throne room to see two people he would have never imagined ever seeing. Especially since they never even saw him or say anything to him in the first place. Gureya, Kakashi. What the hell do you two want? Now, now, no need to get so hostile, said Kakashi, especially since we're not with Kanoha Tibin for a long time. Naruto stopped at that sentence, completely confused and surprised. Let us explain what happened after you were banished, said Jiraiya. Flashback. Jiraiya Sama, you came back from your lead. Asked Kakashi as he was walking back to the village. It was a dead end for Akatsuki. Nothing new from it, replied Jiraiya. Kakashi had been out for a mission while Jiraiya was following a lead. They met up and were currently walking back to Kanoha. Been a few days since I've been gone, said Kakashi. Hopefully, the boys aren't fighting again. I was surprised to see Naruto learn the Rasengan. I had to lecture Sasuke about using Chidori on allies again before I left. Hopefully, our talk made him behave. Undoubted. Sasuke wants power. Hopefully, Tsunade Haim was able to rein him in. Mused Jiraiya. They soon entered the gate to see a huge festival going on. Everyone was drinking and celebrating about something. Huh, what's the festival for? Asked Kakashi. He saw a random Jounin pass by and asked. You don't know Kakashi. Today's a great day. We finally banished the demon yesterday. What? Said Kakashi and Jiraiya darkly. The Jounin was too drunk to notice the tone change. Yay, the council finally decided to banish that QB brat from Kanoha on the premise of death. Banishment's too good for that kid, though. Should have executed him for harming a Chihasama. You should be happy, Kakashi. No more having to pretend to care about that H-U-R-K-K. The Jounin couldn't find himself speaking anymore, as Kakashi had suddenly lifted the Jounin by his throat. His height was already lifted, showing his Sharingan in full blaze. You've broken the Sandame's law in front of children. Any last words? Growled Kakashi. Stop. Kakashi looked around to see Anbu surrounding them. The law was lifted on the day of Naruto's banishment. Kakashi gave the Jounin one more disgusted look before dropping him. Where's Hokage-sama? There's no way she would have accepted this, said Jiraiya. After being pointed to her current residency, they charged in, about to confront her when they saw her state. She had sake bottles littered everywhere. Her hinge was off, showing she no longer cared. She stunk of sake, and it seemed like she hadn't taken a shower within 24 hours. What do you two want? Get out. Leave me in peace, she moaned as she drunkenly grabbed another bottle. After getting the full story from Shizun, Jiraiya stayed to help her with Shizun while Kakashi marched out. Just as he got out, he was confronted by Sasuke and the two elder advisors. 
The Kashi-san, it is the will of the council that you take Sasuke as your personal apprentice and teach him all your jutsus. You should be honored, Kakashi, having Echiha be your apprentice. Even with you fake Sharingan, you'll never reach the height of my clan. Be honored that you may teach a true Sharingan user. Taunted Sasuke. The Kashi looked at them with an eye smile before he snapped. He leaped forward and snapped a back kick into Sasuke's stomach. He flew quite far, seeing as Kakashi didn't hold back. The Kashi. What have you done? You're be taken to Ibiki for harming Ichiha-sama, yelled Himura. I'm punishing him for his attempted desertion of the leaf as his sensei, said Kakashi. It was the cursed seal's fault. I'm sure Ichiha-sama would have never left if it wasn't for that, and the demon child, spat out Kaharu. That's bullshit and you know it. My seal would prevent it from acting up if he truly didn't want to leave, growled Kakashi. Nonetheless, you harmed the last Ichiha. Anbu. Take him in, yelled out Kaharu. Halt. A voice rang out. Everyone looked to see Tsunade had finally left the building. She stared at them before talking. Why is that scum outside? I ordered my shinobis to lock him up, she pointed at Sasuke. Tsunade, be reasonable. If you jail him, it'll cause him to more likely to leave due to injustice, said Hamura. Tsunade slammed her fist into the ground, causing the earth to shake. You have no right to countermand my orders on my shinobi. Also, that's Hokage-sama to you. After Sasuke was quickly taken to his house under house arrest, Kakashi went back to his house. Five hours later, he was summoned to the council. Had a Kakashi, Shinobi Jounin 009720, you have been summoned in front of the council to explain why you do not want to teach Ichihasama the jutsu he deserves to learn, including the Rasengan, said Hamura. The Shinobi Council expressed their outrage at this ridiculous charge, while the Civilian Council was trying to convince the others the Ichiha should learn all that Kakashi had to teach and wanted to also have all the other clans teach him their clan jutsus too. Needlessly to say, it was a bedlam. Soon a day was about to yell for silence, the crackling a lightning, followed by many chirps that could be heard. Everyone looked to the source to find Kakashi with his Shidori blazing at full power. Now that I have your attention, I'd like to announce something. He took his hide off and tossed it in front of Tsunade. I resigned, effective immediately. Everyone was silent at this sudden announcement. Soon, a united uproar came into the room. Everyone was begging or asking Kakashi why. He remained silent, looking at Tsunade only. Alright, fine. Kakashi is no longer a shinobi of the leaf. You are not allowed to join any other villages, though. Kakashi nodded at this before turning around to leave. Before he left, he added, I'm going out of town for a while been a long time since I've had a vacation. Tsunade immediately picked up the hidden meaning. He wanted to go find Naruto and ensure he was safe. All right, approved. You can go. Wait. Everyone turned to look at Danzo, who stood up. If you wish to leave the village, you must relinquish the Sharingan and give it to a worthy successor. The Kashi tossed a scroll onto the floor and activated it, surprising everyone what was in it. There was a jar, and inside it was a floating Sharingan eyeball. Already took it out. Don't need it anymore, replied Kakashi before making a hand sign. Before anyone could react, the jar exploded, destroying the eyeball. I'm not letting anyone take Abito's gift, though. Anbu, seize him for destroying a precious resource. Shouted Danzo. Kakashi laughed at this before suddenly dispersing into smoke, showing that it was a shadow clone. Curse him. Send out the hunter nins. We must kill him for doing such a travesty. Add him to the bingo book. Said Hamura. No. Soon a day's voice was loud and clear. He was officially discharged from service. Nobody will send anyone to find him. That eyeball was his, and he made sure that it wouldn't fall into enemy hands. This meeting is over. Flashback ends. Naruto was staring at Kakashi after they told him their story. He had just noticed that he was wearing a red headband that covered his left eye instead of his usual height. His eyes started to water at this revelation. His senseis didn't abandon him after all. They were just at the wrong place at the wrong time and couldn't help him. Why? He asked. The Kashi took the time to pull out another scroll and unsealed what was inside it. A cabinet with five drawers appeared. As Kakashi pulled out each drawer, they could see it was full of paperwork in each one. This cabinet is records of all the time I tried to adopt you. Every time, I was blocked by the civilian council who controlled the adoption process. Even after each rejection, I still tried. When they threatened me, I pushed back. This process continued until you finally became a shinobi where I could no longer adopt you. Still, I pushed to become your sensei after that. The council only agreed if I took the Chiha with you. When I left, I searched all over the elemental nations for you. I stayed with Koyuki after a while I couldn't find you. Imagine my surprise when she knew where you were. Naruto's eyes were streaming with tears now. After wiping them off, he asked, but you barely taught me anything. 
Even when I asked you to train me for the Chunin exam, you took Sasu team and left me with Ibisu. Bakashi laughed, you really think it was coincident that the first place he took you to train Jiraiya was there. Plus the council forced me to teach him to make sure he would live against a Jinchuriki like you. Naruto realized that Kakashi had already planned with Jiraiya to have him train and make it seem like it was a lucky chance. Jiraiya took this chance to say his piece. After you left, I almost killed the civilian council. The only thing that stopped me was hope that I could find you. When I got a toad saying you took your name out of the contract and jumped over the wall, I was filled with misery. I couldn't tell Kakashi early as he already left, so I decided to do the same and leave Konoha. I claimed asylum with Koyuki-sama later, and she's going to star in my movie, Itcha Itcha Paradise. Jiraiya had a perverted grin at that before becoming serious. Still, the council would be flipping over if they knew whose child they banished, said Jiraiya. I already know who my parents are, replied Naruto. Kakashi and Jiraiya were surprised. Hiashi gave me a scroll explaining everything and also gave me my inheritance. Ha, uh, should've known Hiashi would be the one to tell. He was your father's best friend, said Jiraiya, before realizing something. Wait, your inheritance. Naruto nodded, before disappearing in a yellow flash. Ha. Huh. Guess he learned it after all, chuckled Kakashi as he pulled out his green little book again. It was the latest Itcha Itcha novel. Naruto soon reappeared with Hinata, Niji, Tenten, Konohamaru, and Hanabi. The five of them were leaking huge bloodlust until Naruto, Kakashi, and Jiraiya explained what happened earlier. Soon, tears and hugs were given. Asuma had almost had a heart attack when you disappeared, chuckled Kakashi to Konohamaru. Konohamaru flinched at the name. It's Maru, now. I didn't want to be reminded of Konoha anymore. You guys know what's happening in Konoha right now? Asked Jiraiya. Back at Konoha. Konoha was at an all-time low. The village had no alliances to any major or minor villages anymore. Wave and Sand broke off all agreements, which was followed by Spring and many other places. In total, every place Naruto had been to that aided Konoha was now being thrown back in their face. At first, the whole village was ecstatic that the demon brat was finally gone, but they did not know the consequences that it would bring them. Even the fire daimyo was furious at them and cut down funding to save face against the other daimyos. They lost one of their best elite Jounin and another Sanin and his spy network. Even though it is considered a major village, Konoha was now considered the weakest of all five villages, and its position would soon be usurped by the new sound village. The civilian council, however, didn't care and believed themselves to still be the strongest. However, a new development forced them to recognize the danger they were in. I was Inoki died, and a new Tsuchikage took over who wanted Konoha burned to the ground. Kuritsuchi was slated for it, but somehow disappeared. The Sound Village had allied itself with Iwa and declared war on Konoha. Without any allies, Konoha would die. What was even worse was Arachimaru had been accepted back in the Akatsuki with the disappearance of Itachi and Kisum. Inside the council room. If we don't find a way out of this, Konoha will fall, declared Tsunade. Her eyes were dull, and bags could be seen from under her eyes, signifying she didn't have a good night's sleep. She hadn't had one ever since Naruto had been banished. I don't see what the big problem is, scoffed a pink-haired counselor by the name of Haruno. All we need is a Chihasama leading our army and we'll win. In fact, we should make him Hokage right now. While several of the civilian council agreed, all the others were looking at her if she was retarded. Now isn't the time for a new Hokage, said Danzo. If Konoha is to survive, we must look for someone to help us. Even if it means extending past the wall. Silence pervaded the council room at this statement. Then, outbursts could be heard, everyone. Shut up. Yelled Tsunade, causing everyone to become silent. Anzo is right, we have no choice. We don't have any alliances here. Perhaps we could strike an alliance with the West. We must find some way to send them an envoy of peace. Back at the Imperial Palace. Konoha's on the verge of being burnt to the ground due to the alliance of Odo, Iwa, and Aim with Akatsuki. I'm sure they are still looking for Bijus, but for some reason, most of them have disappeared excluding Gara and Killer B said Jiraiya. He wanted to explain more, but Naruto held his hand up. I already know what's happening there. My spies are in there, giving me information. As for the Jinchurikis, there is no need to worry. The rest of them are all here at the Western Empire. Jiraiya and Kakashi were surprised at that. They didn't think that the West could have sent agents in to spy and get the Baijus to a safe location. Hanoha will try to seek us for an alliance and will most likely try to mercilessly exploit us. No doubt Danzo will demand submission, while Sasu team will demand to be the emperor because he deserves it, continued Naruto. Naruto, I know you have no love for Kanoha anymore, but I beg of you, convince the Romper to at least deter a claim neutrality on this war. There are people still in there who still miss you, like Tucci and Aim. 
Hiruka hates that his adoptive little brother is gone, and soon a day still can't get a good night's sleep, begged Jiraiya and bowed down, head to the ground. You wish to convince the emperor? Asked Hanabi. Jiraiya nodded as well as Kakashi. Meru laughed and all of them pointed at Naruto. He's the emperor, they giggled. At this, Jiraiya and Kakashi dropped the mouths right into the floor. They knew he had potential, but they couldn't imagine that Naruto would become the emperor. I'm not the strongest person in the empire, if that's what you're thinking, said Naruto quickly. There are still many people stronger than me even when I fully tap into Kurama's, QB's real name, power, but they pledged loyalty because they thought I could make the right decisions and lead the empire into a time of peace. Bakashi and Jiraiya looked at each, eye to eye before they started to chuckle. Soon, it became a full-blown laughter, and it was contagious. After they all calmed down, Naruto decided to reveal his plans. You probably don't know, but we hold a grand fighting tournament here. There's one for Tajutsu based only, one for weapons based only, and the last one will be any skills allowed. The general rule is killing is allowed, but discouraged, and the participants must follow the proctor's judgment. We hold it to see who's the best, although a select few choose not to participate to let others have a chance. This year, I've made contact with Koyuki too for anyone who wants to participate in the tournament to gather at the Land of Spring, and everyone from the villages is invited to join, even Odo and Iwa. Before anyone could even make a protest, a voice rang out. The tournament with your old village. Sign me in. They looked to see Yusu grinning like a maniac. Behind him was Itachi and Kisum, who decided to join in to see who came, as well as Uchiru. Jirei and Kakashi immediately took fighting position until Naruto waved them down. He explained the history behind Hitachi and why both of them came with him to the west, as well as telling them that Yusuke was the one who protected them and brought them over. Soon, lunch was served for them all. So, Naruto, who knows you're here besides us? And how did you get information about the elemental nations? Asked Jiraiya, interested in his spy network. It's the Pikara Merchant House, replied Naruto. The Merchant House had suddenly appeared in elemental nations and grew extremely quick, making it one of the successful merchandising organization. To see that underneath it was actually aspiring impressed Jiraiya. They decided to forget about the East for the time being and eat and celebrate a reunion between an emperor, his godfather, and his dad's pupil who could have been his adopted brother. In Konoha, Tsunade was drinking again in her office early in the morning. She couldn't sleep without having nightmares, so she resorted to drinking to take away her misery. Minato. Kashina. I couldn't protect you son. You must be so angry at me right now. She mumbled as she was about to take another sip when the door suddenly burst open. Okage-sama, our sensor nins detected four unknown people headed our way. Said the messenger. So? We get people from time to time now, she said. That's the thing. One of them has chakra levels as high as the nine-tailed fox, maybe even higher. Panicked the messenger. Tsunade stood up fast, shaking off all the drunkenness off her. A mysterious person coming to Kanoha with a high-level chakra. Four in total. Maybe Jiraiya found Naruto at last and was bringing him home. Tsunade could certainly reverse the banishment now that she had the fire daimyo's permission. Jiraiya had certainly told her he was going to look for him when he left her. Jiraiya. That name ached in her heart. For years, she had ignored and punched Jiraiya, but the man always had a place in her heart. Even during her self-exile, Jiraiya at least sent her letter or love notes. To see his face full on anger directed at her for being unable to protect his godson while he was out of the village was one of her worst nightmares, next to seeing Naruto's face when his dreams were crushed. Now that he was gone, she missed him so much. Truly, one doesn't know who they truly loved until they are gone. If Yurei asked her out on a date any time, she would finally accept. But up full alert. Nobody is to engage them. I will personally meet them at the front gates. Have the clan leaders do the same. She ordered the messenger. With that, she ran out of her office to get cleaned up. Tsunade was at the front gate with a nervous Shizun and other clan leaders. Hiashi was still the clan leader of the Hyuga due to his strength, but the heir was now going to another main branch member by the name of Hideki, who certainly enforced the traditional ways. There were rumors how he threatened the branch members with the seal if he didn't get his way, including raping married women. Nobody would confess due to the seal. Tsunade growled at this injustice, but was unable to do anything as it was clan business only. Soon, the four mysterious people could be seen in view. Tsunade's heart sank as she didn't see white hair or spiky blonde on any of the strangers. Instead, three people were walking towards them, and the fourth one was sitting on the shoulder of the very tall man. As Tsunade looked at the tall man, she shivered. If words could describe him, Tsunade would say the man bathed in blood. The four stopped in front of them, and two of them bowed in respect. The tall one just stared at them while the child on his shoulder, while she was looking at a butterfly. Greetings to the Hokage of Kanoha. We are messengers of the Western Empire, here to extend an invitation to a tournament. 
greeted the woman. As soon as they heard, this bells could be seen ringing in everyone's head. They had been looking for a way to contact them, and they brought themselves here. Thank you for your greetings. Allow us to lead you to the council room, where we can discuss more of this, said Tsunade, leading them towards the tower. The council gathered into the room as fast as possible. Tsunade wanted to avoid the civilian council, but couldn't stop them as news traveled fast about visitors from the Western Empire. Soon, it was full, and many shinobi and citizens were crowding to see them. The well-toned female wore a tight purple spandex with green stripes at the sides. The suit certainly accentuated her figure and her big breasts, and it could be easily seen that she didn't wear underwear, causing quite a few nosebleeds. Her long luscious blonde hair and blue eyes made her a target to chase. The other man wore a white karate guy and kung fu pants. His brown hair and brown eyes made him seem like he was normal, like a civilian. He was built very well, though. Muscles could easily be seen on his arm and seemed to be leaning towards a lean man instead of a bodybuilder. Tsunade signaled the Anbu guarding the room to quickly shut the door so the meeting could get started. The girl on the man's shoulder was eating a box of chocolate, shutting out the tension in the room. Before Tsunade could speak, Hamura spoke first. Well, what brings you here to Konoha, he spat out, looking at them as if they were dirt. None of them responded. Answer us, you stupid bints. Screeched Haruno Asana. The messengers just looked at each other before looking straight at Tsunade. We were unaware that Kanoha managed to employ banshees. Nonetheless, is it not courtesy to allow your esteemed leader to open up the conversation? Said the woman tactfully. The shinobi council chuckled at this statement while Hamura and Asana were left steaming. Indeed, I was about to ask when my advisor overstepped her authority. He will be heavily reminded of who is in charge, said Tsunade as she glared at Hamura. May I ask your names and your business here as envoys of the West? The female nodded. My name is Furinji Mu, next to me is Shirahama Kinichi. The man with the child on his shoulder is Zaraki Kanpachi and Yuchiru Kusajishi. We come on behalf of the Empire to invite Kanoha to a tournament. There will be three of them, all held at the same place, but at different times to allow everyone to enjoy. The first one will be a Tejutsu based tournament. The second one is a weapons only tournament. The last one is where anyone can use anything, as long as you obey the proctor. We can explain it in more details later if you like. You will be allowed to enter a maximum of seven contestants for each one. The person can join more than one tournament, but it will count as one of your entries, of course. I suggest you bring your strongest members to the tournament, otherwise you might not escape humiliation from the other villages. HMPH, I could win this easily, said a voice. The visitors turned to see Ichiha Sasuke smirking, who had taken the council seat of the Ichiha clan. Each of them frowned as they remembered who it was that caused Naruto to be banished in the first place. I am an elite. Nobody stands before me. Well then Ichiha-san, you're volunteering to go to the tournament I presume? Said Kenichi, he did not like how he was eyeing Mew. Know your place, scum, growled Sasuke, his Sharingan blazing. Ichiha-Sasuke, turn off your Sharingan. It is forbidden to do that without permission. Yelled Tsunade. Sasuke ignored her until the pink-haired girl suddenly appeared in front of his face. Everyone was surprised at the girl's speed and hadn't even noticed her move. Ahiha stupid duck that doesn't know how to listen or stare, giggled Yuchiru as she poked Sasuke's eye with her two fingers. The Ichiha roared in pain at this sudden poke and fell down to the ground. He opened his eyes, allowing everyone to see he could still see, although his Sharingan was now off and his eyes were red. Ichiru, don't go poking strangers. You don't know what you'll catch, lectured Mew. Hi, Yuchiru replied as she jumped back onto Kenpachi's shoulder. Anbu, seize them for attacking the Ichiha. Yelled out Kaharu. Enough. Tsunade slammed her fist into the desk, causing everyone to become silent. It is his own fault for not obeying my order. Do it again, Ichiha, and you will be taken to Anko and Ibiki again. Sasuke growled but obediently obeyed. He knew that she had no real power to do so, as long as the civilian council and the elders worshipped him. As my companion was continuing, said Kenichi, the tournament is where our people test their limits. Hold up, I have a question, said Danzo. Kenichi looked at Tsunade, who nodded and allowed Danzo to continue his question. What do you mean by other villages? Asked Danzo. Simple. You are not the only major village being invited to this tournament, replied Kenichi. About now, Kumo, Suna, Iwa, Kurigakur, and even Odo should have received envoys to be invited to this tournament. Tetsu has been given the same offer for weapons. Everyone was silent at this. Tsunade picked up the conversation, you mean, you're also inviting our enemies. Rest assured, you will all have different quarters and will be heavily monitored. No fighting unless it's in the tournament will be allowed. The Kages will be allowed to enter the tournament, but is restricted to one tournament choice only. We do encourage them to come watch if they do not wish to participate. 
We will also allow a maximum of 10 people outside the competitors to accompany you. You will all meet at the Land of Spring, where we will provide transportation to the West, where the tournament will be held. Your daimyos have already been notified and have agreed on a ceasefire in any war for now. The prize money for winning the tournament is. 100 million ryo. The council held their breath. With that much money, Kanoha would have enough to funds for the war. Until Kanichi said, each. At this, the council burst into cheers. Here was a way to be able to make sure Kanoha was the strongest again. They didn't even bother thinking about if they lost. The civilians were too busy imagining the Achiha bringing home the money. While there was much talk, Danzo kept his eye on Kenpachi. This man. His chakra level is off the roof. If I use my Kodamitsukami on him, I would have a powerful tool to help me kick Tsuna Day off and become Hokage, like I should have been. I could rule all the elemental nations. And why stop there? I could have this whole continent bowing before Kanoha. Thought Danzo. He subtly activated his eye, making sure nobody was paying attention to him, and directed it right at Kenpachi. He made sure he used as much chakra as he could to influence him. However, he hit a huge snag on that part. Kenpachi felt the Jinjutsu and started chuckling. Before long, it started to get louder, catching everyone's attention. Soon, his maniacal laughter could be heard from even the people trying to eavesdrop outside the chamber, and that was something since there were heavy silencing seals to prevent eavesdroppers. All right, who challenged me? Laughed Kenpachi. He drew his sword out, allowing them to get a closer glance at it. It didn't seem special and had jagged edges over it. Before they could think about it, Kenpachi's chakra shot up. A visible yellow aura could be seen around him, and it was growing. Cracks could be seen in the council room, and all the civilian council fainted and relieved themselves of their waste. The shinobi council had trouble trying to prevent themselves from following the same fate. The roof started to let out streams of dust, letting them know that if Kenpachi continued, the roof would fall on them. The Anbu were rooted to their position, fearing too much against the man, until Mu actually stood in front of them. Stop, she said calmly. All of a sudden, that suffocating feeling stopped. Kenpachi glared at her for a while, before reluctantly agreeing to it. And Chan, you made me drop a chocolate. Pouted Yuchiru from his shoulder. She hadn't even moved when Kenpachi raised his chakra levels. What on earth happened, asked Shikaku. I guess. Someone tried to influence Kenpachi or put him in a Jinjustu, which doesn't really work on him since he's very bloodthirsty. Either way is one sure way to make him think someone's challenging him. Shrugged Kenichi. Makes you wonder, though, who did it? Tsunade growled at this. Someone had actually tried to control an envoy of the West. This action could have brought the West into the war as enemies, something Kanoha did not need. I apologize for this. It was not my intent, nor was it my order, to do such a travesty to you all. Please, allow me to provide a room for you to rest for the night. I promise nobody will try such a thing again. As for the tournament, Kanoha accepts. Acceptable. We will leave tomorrow morning back to the Empire to give your answer. The tournament start in a month and will last for six days. We will graciously host everyone for nine days. Two days to get used to our empire, and one day to allow yourselves to pack up and leave. We will, of course, provide food, medical assistance, and beds for you all free of charge, replied Kenichi as he bowed with Mew. All of them went walking towards the exit. W.W. Wait, stuttered Hamura. You need to be punished for such actions in the council room. Perhaps as hostages with Ibiki and Anko at the T&I department until the tournament will teach you. At this, Kenpachi felt this had gone long enough. He ripped his eye patch off, showing that he could see perfectly with his right eye. This surprised all the conscious shinobis until he turned his gaze back at them again and let loose. The yellow aura could be seen again, except this time it thickly saturated the air. A huge skull could be seen forming above him. Just try it, punks. I could use a good fight, though it doesn't really seem like everyone in this village would even provide a good warm-up. Mew and Kinichi showed no signs of evenly remotely trying to stop him. Kurumeru was trying to dig his way out now, his animal instincts telling him to escape. Now, several of the clan heads had followed the civilian's example and fainted, along with the elders. The only people who were still conscious was Tsunade, Hiashi, Tsum, Shikaku, Inachi, Chauza, Asuma, and Danzo, but barely. Tsunade was able to break out of her fear before yelling, Stop. I promised you all safety, and I'll ensure it. The elders will be brought to the T&I department for suggesting such a thing. Kenichi nodded and put his hand on Kenpachi's arm. Kenpachi just made a TSK noise before putting his eye patch back on and left. Be warned, our rules are quite strict. Do something like this again, and the offender will be executed, no hesitation. Once you have made your decision on who will compete and who will accompany them to visit, give your list to the Picara Merchant House. They are the West's Merchant House, after all. Kenichi mentioned before leaving. 
a Shinobus let a sire a leaf out for avoiding such danger when Tsunade whirled upon all of them. Let them all up. I want everyone interrogated. I don't want people who would blatantly try to undermine my authority and think they could get away with it. This includes the elders. Nobody is exempt. No exceptions. Commanded Tsunade as she ran out the room. She would use the Senju compound to house the visitors, but she needed to make sure that it was clean enough. Also, she needed to relay a command to all Shinobis. Nobody was allowed to harass them. Anzo was there, steaming. How could Kota Mitsukami fail him? Perhaps he needed to see a doctor and make sure that a Sharingan that he liberated for the good of Kanoha was working. When Sasuke woke up, he was disgusted and quickly left to change clothes. His thought process was, how could that man be so much more powerful to me? I should have that. I must get it to kill Itachi, who I'm sure is out there somewhere. His thoughts turned towards the female envoy. I must have her. She will be able to provide powerful children to revive the Ichiha clan. Her beauty belongs to me, just as everything else should be. At all the other major shinobi villages and samurai village. While Kanoha received their invite, all the other villages were met with envoys of the west. Suna, Tetsu, Kiri, and Kumo, although wary, accepted peacefully. Iwa and Odo had a bit more trouble. Iwa tried to kill them, while Odo tried to keep them hostage for Orochimaru to experiment on. Unfortunately for both of them, they found the tables reversed easily. Yusuke was part of the envoy to Iwa and just blasted their Anbu during the meeting with a shotgun. Odo was met with Naiko Robin, who just broke their ninja's back using her Hanahana no Mii to grow arms all over the ninjas with a clutch before they could do anything. She was accompanied by her husband, Rurano's Oro, who merely needed to stare at them before they decided to stop. They also accepted. To nobody's surprise, that group took longer to get back to the west due to Zoro. Tetsu agreed for weapons tournament only. Aka Kanoha. He, I'm hungry Ken-chan. Let's go eat, Mew Mew, Kai-chan, giggled Yuchiro after the group had explored Kanoha a bit after the meeting. Many citizens were still staring at them, but they ignored it. I wouldn't mind getting something to eat, either. Let's head to that place for lunch, said Kenichi, pointing coincidentally at Ichiraku Raymond. Before they could enter, they were intercepted by several shinobis. They were the leftover bunch of genins in Naruto's generation, Shikamaru, Chaoji, Ino, Sakura, Shino, Lee, and Kiba. So you're the envoys of the West, huh? Troublesome, said Shikamaru. Tauji just kept eating his chips, while Lee no and Sakura were carefully studying Mew. Her chests, her well-toned body, and her beautiful legs were certainly something to be envious of. Compared to her, they felt, lacking in several departments. Kiba was busy panting like a dog, seeing a beautiful woman, while Shino. Was still Shino. Before anyone could do anything, Lee ran in front and kneeled, carrying. Flowers. Oh loveliest of beauty, please go out with me. My name is Rock Lee, and my flames of youth tells me you are the perfect match for me, for we both wear spandex suit. Yelled out Lee. Everyone sweat dropped at this intro. The envoy's first impression was that this man's eyebrows were huge. You just looked at him before chuckling a little and replying. I apologize Lee. You're not my type. Also, I'm already happily in. This woman obviously deserves an elite, like me. Lee, make yourself useful and go bug off, she's obviously going to become one of my wives interrupted a voice. Everyone looked with disdain as Sasuke stepped forward. Everyone except Sakura, who was still using her loud voice to proclaim how the Ichiha was the greatest. Ino had finally seen the light, though quite forcefully by a combination of Inachi, Anko, and Shikamaru, and stopped trying to chase Sasuke. She was able to recognize that Sasuke was a jerk and didn't deserve her attention. Her focus, right now, were a bit more focused on looking for other men, especially the lean-looking man next to Mew. How about it, Mew-san? Come with me, and you'll bear my children to help repopulate the Ichiha clan. You obviously deserve someone of my elite status, said Sasuke. Without hearing a reply, he went to grab her hand to pull her towards his home. With luck, he could expect a baby within nine months. While he was still dreaming, a punch met right into his face. He flew back due to the impact and rolled quite a bit before impacting on a wall. And went through it. Shaking his head, he saw that Kenichi had just punched him and was standing in front of Mew. Do not touch my fiancé shouted Kinichi. Sasuke growled. This puny man was engaged to the ethereal beauty. Before he could attack, Sakura screamed and threw a punch at Kinichi. You bastard. How dare you attack Sasuke-kun. Stand still so I can beat you. Screeched Sakura. Kinichi merely dodged all of them but didn't counterattack. Why aren't you attacking back? Questioned Ino. She knew this man could have countered Sakura. Sorry, it's a principle of mine to not hurt women, said Kinichi, dodging a kick. Then stand still so I can hit you screamed Sakura. That's why I'm here. To hit women that Kenichi won't hit, said Mew, blocking a fist and uppercutting Sakura. 
Yu then gripped Sakura's neck and kneed her in the chest several times. She then whirled around Sakura, grabbing her head and using it as a center. Yu kneed Sakura in the head again while spinning. She then used the momentum to toss herself up into the air. Sakura, still dizzy from all the attacks she took, didn't notice the danger that was coming and fell to the floor. Spinning like a high-speed drill, one of Mew's leg was straight up, showing how flexible she was. With one of her legs up and her hugging that leg, the remaining pivot leg came crashing down into Sakura. The ground behind Sakura broke. Yorinji Kihuyoku. Mew yelled. To the audience who saw this, they could have sworn that feathery wings sprouted at the end of her attack, with Mew at the center of it. Such power. Such grace. Such beauty. She will belong to me. Thought Sasuke as he prepared to use his Sharingan to hypnotize this woman to come with him. Before he could do such a thing, a pan met with his face, knocking him unconscious. I've told you before Itcha has come, you're not allowed to stop within 100 feet of my shop and my daughter after that stunt you tried to pull. Yelled Tucci, who had come out to see what was going on. Anbu units appeared before them. Yu and Kenichi were ready to fight when one of the Anbu with a dragon mask stepped forward. Do not worry. We are here to arrest Harino Sakura and Ichiha Sasuke for harassing you. Hokage Sama ordered all shinobis to not do so. Unfortunately, it seems Ichiha san thought himself above the rules. They will be taken to the T and I department to be re educated on following orders. The Anbu took Sasuke to Anko, while Sakura was first taken to the hospital for treatment. Diba whistled. He wanted to hit on you, but he even he knew when to back off if a woman was already claimed by another man. That, and the woman didn't seem afraid to kick him in the balls if she needed to, and Kiba preferred to remain a man. That was. Powerful, said Shino. You folks are certainly welcomed in my shop if you don't like the Achiha, laughed Tucci. After a quick introduction, the envoys went into the Raymond shop, while the rest of the Shinobis went on to their own business. Orders were quickly placed, and soon four steaming hot Raymond were ready. Tucci didn't notice that Mew had subtly placed a silencing seal on the flaps, so nobody could overhear what they would say while they were eating. This ramen is pretty good. I can see why Naruto recommended this place, said Kenichi casually as he finished his meal. A.M. and Tucci froze up at that statement before tears started to fill their eyes as they remembered the little boy they had come to see as family. Where is he? Please. Tell me where my favorite little brother went. Sobbed A.M. She was so heartbroken when Naruto was banished that she could barely help out at the shop. The Ichiha tried to take advantage of her and wanted to practice making babies with her, while saying any child wouldn't be part of the Ichiha clan and should be proud he lowered himself to her. That day, Sasuke found out that a Raymond cook that occasionally dealt with ninjas and was filled with rage shouldn't be trifled with. Kenichi looked around to see make sure nobody was listening in before continuing, he's fine right now. He's at the Western Empire. Naruto wishes that he could see you two again, but couldn't risk dying. He tossed a pouch to Tucci. This should more than cover our meal and all the meals Naruto ate at your place on his tab. As they all left to head back to the location Tsuna Day had promised to let them sleep at, Yuchiro mentioned, that was good, too kun, Aya-chan. If you wanna leave with us, just show up see ya, as Kenpachi opened the flap to let them all out. As soon as they left, Tuchi and AM quickly closed the business for the day before rushing upstairs to the privacy of their house. They opened the pouch to see priceless gems and gold. What caught their attention, though, was a letter with Naruto's handwriting. Opening it up with shaky hands, they read the letter. Soon, the letter became illegible as tears were dripping down on the letter. Quickly, they burned it to show now proof. As it was burning, Tucci looked at AM and said, well, I think it's time we relocated our business. We haven't been doing well here, and I see a prospective place we can open. Thanks for watching guys. Hope did you enjoyed this video if you do please leave a like share and subscribe, also don't forget to leave love to author of this fanfic link in description. Take care bye we'll see you in next video.